Okay, so uh, we'll pick up in our conversion stories, Acts chapter 18. Paul uh, is in Corinth. That's very valuable to us. Paul is in Corinth and he's going to convert the uh, Crispus, who is the ruler of the synagogue, which was a, a major uh, accomplishment, you would think, because that's he's going to be the guy that's uh, going to be teaching the rest of the flock there. So let's look at chapter 18. We'll begin in verse 8. It says, And Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, uh, believed uh, in the Lord, together with his entire household. Many of the Corinthians, uh, hearing Paul, they believed and were baptized. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid. Go on speaking and do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you to harm you. For I have many people in this city who are my people. And he stayed a year and six months. I think I put a square around that. That's a good piece of information. Paul stayed a year and six months in Corinth teaching the word of God amongst them. That was a pretty long time, wasn't it? That was quite, that was, I, I think... Uh, well, I think, F, yeah, that's a long time because Paul didn't, I think his longest was three years in Ephesus, but still a year and a half in Corinth. So, you know, what's going to be extremely valuable, guys, is when you're reading, in fact, you might turn over to 1 Corinthians and just make a note, converted in Acts chapter 18. So whenever we read the book of Corinthians, you're going to know what Paul how Paul established the church, what he taught them, and that he spent a year and a half there uh, planting that. So 1 Corinthians, uh, just remember that Paul established it in Acts chapter 18. A couple things I wanted to draw your attention to. Uh, chapter 18 and verse 8, believed and were baptized. I would put a square around that. Because that is the same identical language that we are going to see. Let me think here. Mark 16. Let's look over at Mark 16. So, yes. More than 10 conversion stories because there's a, conver a whole bunch of conversion stories. <laughs> a whole bunch of people were converted. <laughs> Mark 16, 16. Uh, this is what I would call corroboration, guys. Anytime you can see the exact same thing told by different people in different books of the Bible, uh, it's corroborating that that was the... Uh, there's a word called uh, canon. Ooh, this, will be, this, will be in, this might be interesting. Let me think here. This word in the New Testament gets translated the rules or, um, shoot, I'm just winging it. But there is an idea in the New Testament whenever this word canon, K-A-N-O-N, -N, the canon, the rules that we gave you, it's kind of a neat study because throughout the Testament, there it's affirming that there is a specific set of rules, a specific um, canon that we have delivered to you guys, and that's the rule. That's what everybody's kind of expected to obey. Um, so that's interesting, but uh, here we see it corroborated. Let me see. Where did I send you, Mark 16? Okay, so yeah, I'd hold your finger back there at Acts chapter 18, because we're looking at uh, the Corinthians heard Paul, believed and were baptized. If you had a square around that, look at what Jesus uh, tells his disciples in Mark 16 and verse 15. And he had said to them, uh, Go into all the world, proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Whoever does not believe will be condemned. And we see that phrase, believed and was baptized. We see that exact same structure repeatedly in the book of Acts. So, I just think that that's something to make note of, part of the canon, part of the rules that the apostles passed on. Many people in this city, and like we already talked about, uh, he stayed there for a year and a half. 
Okay, so that's the story of the Corinthian conversions. Just a couple points of interest as we work our way to the last conversion story. That's in chapter 19. Uh, when Paul gets done in Corinth, he travels through Ephesus but doesn't have time to stay and works his way all the way down to Caesarea. And I wanted us to note that when Paul works his way down to Caesarea, the text tells us that he went and greeted the church, quote unquote. There was a church already there. So I wanted us to tie something together. So back to Acts 18, let's look at verse 19. And he came to Ephesus and he left them there, but he himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to stay for a longer period, he declined. Uh, but on taking leave of them, I will return to you if God wills. And he set sail from Ephesus, and when he had landed at Caesarea, he went up and greeted, and I put a box around the church. I think that's pretty neat that he already found a church in Caesarea, and we saw that church get established. Uh, so let's just kind of go back, go back to Acts chapter 8, and let's take a look at the attention that the church in Caesarea got. <clears throat> Caesarea. <clears throat> Our first story, Acts chapter 8, 38 to 40. 8, 38? Yeah. So what we're going to see is three different vital evangelists going out and we're going to get to see what all three people taught to the exact same congregation. We'll read this one first, Acts 8 and 38. This is Philip that's going to make his way over to Caesarea. And he commanded the chariot to stop and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more. He went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azatos, and as he passed through, he preached the gospel in all the towns until he came to Caesarea. So if I draw a horrible depiction of the Mediterranean, Jerusalem's over here somewhere. Um, the road to Gaza came down this way. Azados, if I remember correctly, was down here kind of low. And then it says he preached the gospel all the way to where? Caesarea. So he comes up and Caesarea is here. We'll put Jerusalem over here. And he, what he does basically is he works his way. It names a few cities. He works his way all the way up the coast. So all this area gets evangelized by Philip. And what's great about that is we know what Philip's message was. The gospel, repent and be baptized. So Philip is our first guy to, that we have recorded uh, that works his way to Caesarea and preaches the gospel. Let's look at the second one, Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10 and verse 48, uh, Peter was sent to Cornelius. Do you remember where Cornelius lived? Caesarea. Cornelius was a centurion in the Roman army. So this area, uh, Caesarea, had the Roman army was stationed there. That would have been where the governor, Pontius Pilate, all those guys would have lived here. So Peter gets sent there to convert one of these Roman soldiers. We'll read his, let me see, Acts 10. Where should we start? Where does it look like we need to start, guys? Marty, you want to read that 46 to 48, Acts 10. For well, they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God, and Peter declared, Can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to remain for some days. Cool. So the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured on before baptism. Yeah. Yeah, so you've got, you got two instances. <clears throat> okay, so we'll take a break. 
the Holy Spirit in Joel chapter 2 is what the book of A the, the, the Joel 2. Joel 2 is prophesying that in that day when the day of the Lord arrives, he's prophesying that it's going to be unmistakable. You're Young men will dream dreams. You're young, and it's and the, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is unlimited. Young men, young women, uh, women, they'll all prophesy. They'll speak in tongues. So there is going to be this massive display of, I guess, if you want to call it Holy Spirit power. And that's what Joel promised in Acts chapter two. Peter says, all these people that are speaking in tongues. That is, this is what Joel promised us. It's happening right now. The day of the Lord, the power of the Holy Spirit. This is God making sure nobody misses this moment in time. So the way I think of it, guys, is if you were, uh, my own little example, if you were to be on a desert island and a plane was coming by and you wanted him to see you, you'd throw up what? A flare. And what's the purpose of the flare? Get their attention and say, I'm here. How long does that flare last? I think that's your, your perfect explanation, guys, because if the flare stayed on for six days, you know, uh, it would be useless to the people that are trying to identify. So, uh, the Joel 2 outpouring was like a flare. It's like, here it is. This is the day of the Lord. It's, un, it's undeniable. But then as you start reading in the scripture, there's a place where it says that Paul had the, the power of the Holy Spirit was so strong that even Paul's handkerchief could be sent to someone's house and the person was healed. Yeah. Um, who was it that when they walked, if somebody at the shadow passed on to somebody they were healed just from his shadow so this power that fell on the people was unmistakable <clears throat> but later on you hear Paul talking about well I have a, a, a thorn in the flesh that I can't get rid of uh, was it Timothy that had a stomach problem and he said Timothy drink a little wine for your stomach and maybe it'll okay so he didn't heal Timothy the do you remember huh that's right. Paul said, I have this uh, thorn in the flesh and it won't go away. And then um, who was the guy that Paul said dedicated so much time to me and he was sick almost to the point of death. So I'm sending him back to you so that you won't be grieved any longer. Does that ring a bell? Basically, what you see in Scripture is Paul, who had the most miraculous powers towards the end, can't heal himself, can't heal Timothy. Maybe, uh, Onesimus was the slave, uh, or the slave owner, I should say. <clears throat> no, no, Philemon was the slave owner and Onesimus was a slave. But you see that this waning of the power. So that was a long explanation, Marty. Um, what happened with the Gentiles is during that same period of time, the Holy Spirit also fell on the Gentiles. But what was... What do you think was the purpose of it falling on the Gentiles, judging by Peter's reaction? Probably to change his mind about the Gentiles being included. included. Yeah, because the Gentiles up to this time were defiled. You can't go to their house. You can't eat with them. Stay away from them. But the whole thing about the prophecies in the Old Testament was there would be a day when God would raise up a sign and all people would be drawn to inquire about God. The sign was the resurrection. And all the nations would be included. So the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that happened on Cornelius and his household uh, was a part of the fulfillment of the prophecies in Joel, but more importantly, it served to announce to the Gentile, to the Jews, now is the time for the gospel to include everybody, not just the Jews. Does that make sense? Yep. <clears throat> Those are the only times you see the Holy Spirit miraculously poured out 
all the rest of the times in Scripture, people are given the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit, but only after the apostles lay hands on them. And you think uh, in that first, you know, when 3,000 people were converted, how many people do you need to bless with the Holy Spirit if you want to go out and convert the whole world? I guess you could, you could keep going on. But just think of everybody that was in Rome that was all going to go back home. The people that went back home to Egypt, the people that went back home to Africa, back, back home to Rome. I think those people took the power back with them as a, as a testimony. <clears throat> okay, good. That was a real compressed view, but I think that's all right. So now um, Caesarea sure is getting a lot of evangelists coming their way, and that's where the church comes from. He went up and he greeted the church that was in Caesarea. Uh, and then we see that Paul goes there next and he hangs out. So you've got three evangelists that have all been going out preaching the same exact message. We'll stay in 18 and let's just catch just a little glimpse of this uh, other situation that happened. Acts 18, verse 24. <clears throat> 18 and verse 24. A Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria. Alexandria is down in Egypt. Uh, he was an eloquent man and he was competent in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord. Being very fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus. So a little insight for us. The, a guy all the way from Egypt was out preaching and he knew the story of Jesus. Though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. And when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and they explained to him the way of God more accurately. Just a couple of things that I wanted to walk away from there. Um, Priscilla and Aquila. Does anybody know where they were from and what they were doing over here? They're from Rome. Yeah. And they were there because they got kicked out. There you go. Uh, double check me, but I think in Acts... 18 verses 1 and 2. <coughs> okay, somebody double check that. <clears throat> yeah. What does it say? So, here's a little uh, inductive or deductive reasoning. I don't remember which one it is. Deductive. deductive. <laughs> here's Priscilla and Aquila, newly arrived in Corinth because they fled Rome. Because as you guys know, in 49, Claudius... And it says there, kicked all the Jews out of Rome. Good. So they, they just left Rome. They recently arrived in Corinth. And they are correcting a guy that was from Egypt. And they are teaching him the way of God more accurately. What does that tell us about Rome? Rome already had the gospel. So Rome, <laughs> way over here, whatever, right? <clears throat> they came all the way over to uh, Greece. Corinth is right over here. And they are preaching and teaching the word of God accurately. So that tells us Rome already had the gospel. So by the time Paul writes to the Romans... In 56, he's writing a church that's already firmly established. Oh, Aquila was originally from Pontus, but he had gotten married and he had come from Italy with his wife. Okay. Um, and then, of course, we take that back to Acts chapter 2, when Paul was preaching and 3,000 people were saved. Uh, it says there were visitors there from all around the world, Phrygia, Pamphylia, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to well, Judaism. Peter and Peter was the one preaching back then. <laughs> yeah. 
Okay, so Rome had the gospel. Let's see. Yeah, I think that covers it. Let's look at number 10. We'll, we'll do the last, the last one in our list, guys. <clears throat> number 10. What church are we in? Ooh. Number 10. <clears throat> Acts chapter 19, starting in verse 1. Now it happened that while Apollos was over in Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples, and he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you, were be when you believed? They said, No, we haven't even heard that there was a Holy Spirit. He said, So what, into what then were you baptized? And they said, Into John's baptism. Paul said, well, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is Jesus. So on hearing this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. <clears throat> I would uh, first, guys, let's make a mark in our Bibles. Go over to the book of Ephesus. And I would uh, write in the first page of uh, the book of Ephesians. I say. <laughs> On the first page there, the book of Ephesians, I'd give yourself a little note that we can know exactly what happened in that little church before Paul ever wrote them this letter. So at the top of the title page to Ephesians, I would reference it Acts 19, 1 through 5. Acts 19, 1 through 5. And Ephesians is where a lot of people get uh, Paul's theology from. In fact, I think it's Ephesians chapter 2. <clears throat> I won't go into, yeah, I won't go into the whole thing, but let's just glance at what did he write to the Ephesian church Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8. Ephesians 2 and verse 8. Yeah. For by grace you were saved through faith, not of your own doing, but it's the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one can boast. Uh, maybe in a future class we'll go through and exposit that so that we know exactly what he does mean. But have you ever noticed that if you bring up baptism as a command of God, a lot of people will quote Ephesians 2 and say, nope, you don't have to do anything to be saved. It's not of works. It's just a free gift. So what will be... What's that? For we are His workmanship, created by Christ Jesus for good works. Yeah, it's right there. So it will, it will be interesting to know what, whatever Paul meant by what he said in Ephesians chapter 2, Let's always remember what Paul did when he got to Ephesus. He basically said, Did you get the right baptism? That was what he did in Ephesians, in, in Ephesus. Did you guys get the right baptism? Well, did you get the Holy Spirit? No. Then you need to be baptized again. We would call that re-baptized. <clears throat> Into Christ. This is a really important part of understanding the theology of Ephesians. How could you use the book of Ephesians to say, you see, you don't need to do anything to get saved because you're not saved by works. If Paul, while he was in Ephesus, said, hey, your baptism didn't count. Well, let's just say it, it's been updated. So you guys, not, not, not only did you already been baptized, you need to get baptized again. So it would seem weird to argue that Paul didn't think that it was important. <clears throat> uh, 
Paul stays in Ephesus for two years. And let's note uh, Acts 19 and verse 10. Acts 19 and verse 10. This continued for two years so that all the residents of Asia heard the Word of God. Let's get a, a picture of what that looked like. Oh, this is something like this. And then over here. So this is where Jerusalem is at. This is Syria. This is what they called Asia. Today it's called modern Turkey. You go across the water and then right through here, Macedonia, yeah, Macedonia, Greece. Next to that is the boot. Italy. So Ephesus is right here. But what does it say about Paul preaching in Ephesus? He stayed for two years and did what? Huh? Preached to all the Jews and Greeks. Where? In Asia. In all of Asia. All the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord. So here it is, guys. Paul takes care of this area. He started down here in this area. Uh, we'll remember Philip got sent down the road to Gaza down here to whatever that city was called. And then he evangelized all the way up to Caesarea. So all this was evangelized. We know Jerusalem was evangelized all the way up into Syria because Antioch is up here. And that was the home base for Paul. That text tells us that all Asia had received the gospel by Paul. We know Paul preached in Corinth, Athens, Philippi, Thessalonica, all of those are in here. And when Paul, when the scripture says about Paul that he preached from Jerusalem, this was in the sermon. Does anybody remember? From Jerusalem all the way over to right here. Illyr, Illyricum. Remember that? What? No way would I have. Okay. Well, here's the lyric. So he said, Jerusalem, Paul preached. He said, I've preached from Jerusalem all the way over right here. Illyricum. And he says, there's nowhere left for me to preach around here. I've already done it everywhere around here. Where does he want to go to next? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So that's when he writes the book of Romans. Because he says, I want to go to Spain. So what I'm going to do is first, I have to go back to Jerusalem to do what? Deliver the money that was collected for all the poor. And then that's when he writes the letter to Rome and says, so if it's Lord willing, then after I've been back to Jerusalem and delivered the money, I want to work my way over to Italy so that you guys can support me and help me go preach the gospel in Spain. Um, I think tradition has it that when Paul got out of jail, he did preach in Spain and then he was put in jail again and martyred by Nero. I think that's history. I, I'm not 100% positive about that. Okay. Preached to all the residents in Asia. I think that's it, guys. That's it. Any thoughts, questions, insights?